I'm going to do something today that I don't do very often, and that is bring a guest back for a second interview. But I really thought you needed to hear directly from Dr. Will Moravitz. He has been receiving some national attention lately um, because of a book that he wrote called The Blue Divide and uh, how that affected his life as a college professor. So, Dr. Moravitz, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me again. Appreciate it. So you wrote a book called The Blue Divide. It's actually recommended reading in every class that uh, I teach to police officers. And you are a former police officer. And uh, and yeah. you decided to, uh, you know, get smart, get that Ph.D., go into academia <laughs> and uh, and uh, talk about the book that you decided to write. Well, you know, as you remember from our interview last year, uh, I really started to write the book after the summer of 2020 uh, with the defund the police movement, um, talking about uh, the high profile killings, uh, usually of, of black men uh, in class is something I'd been doing, you know, basically since the beginning of my my uh, higher ed teaching career, kind of give, you know, the, the students an overview of basic use of force training, the law, and and why the police are trained the way they are, and why, you know, things like oh well, you know, you you can't shoot an unarmed person, you know, is, is not true. There are circumstances that that's a justifiable use of force. Uh, and then after that particular summer, I thought, you know, I need to try to get this out to a wider audience, and and you know, write a book and just give give it an attempt to educate the general public um, because I kept seeing so much misinformation from the media and misrepresentation. I thought that it's the least I can do for the profession that gave me so much. And the book is, uh, it's fantastic. What it does is it helps fight that false narrative that somehow American law enforcement is the problem. So, right. you know, you wrote the book, you're, you're going along with your career uh, as a college professor. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, as a college professor, um, you are encouraged to get published. Correct. Now, my uh, full-time employer was a, a local community college in the San Antonio area, um, and I worked adjunct at Texas State University. Uh, so being published at the community college level is, an, is not the norm. Um, usually it's something that would be celebrated at any level. Uh, but it's not required for my, for my particular position. Um, but yeah, traditionally, you know, like at Texas State, my department, if a professor writes a book, they have a copy of it on display in the office, um, regardless of the topic, because it is something that brings prestige to the institution. So here you are teaching, you know, government and, and topics like that. And uh, there started to be a little concern on campus with the book and your views as it relates to the American law enforcement officer. Um, and, uh, and, and again, that false narrative, talk about that a little bit. Sure. So, you know, I was doing, you know, my round promoting uh, the book last spring. Uh, it was my first spring with this particular uh, institution, St. Philip's college uh, in San Antonio, which, Despite the name, it is a public institution now. It did start off as a private, but it's been public for a number of decades. Um, and, you know, you were actually my first interview. Uh, most of the interviews I did were, were fairly friendly to law enforcement, or at least in the middle. Uh, but one particular interview I did was with a progressive leftist who is pretty suspicious of police, to say the least. We had a good conversation. Um, he wrote about our conversation in the Daily Coast. And it got the attention of an employee at the college, and they took uh, umbrage with uh, some of the things that I said I taught in class, um, you know, namely that police are not uh, discriminatory in their uh, use of force, deadly force uh, with black people. Uh, and one particular video that I would, would often show is the old uh, skit from the 1990s Chris Rock show, which was how not to get your ass beat by the police, which is kind of a, it's a funny video that kids tend to remember, uh, but there is a lot of legitimate good information in there. Um, and, you know, and so I had to meet with the one of the vice presidents and members of HR uh, to kind of defend myself of why am I teaching this in class? And, and again, this is a political science class where the textbook talks about Black Lives Matter and actually promotes in the textbook 
the false narrative that police, uh, you know, killing of black people is is basically that blacks are, are, are misrepresented or disproportionately affected, I should say, uh, which the the actual data does not support. And so you talk about one of the things you talk about, right, is the actual data when it comes to police use of force. And the different, you know, races that we end up using deadly force against. And uh, and we'll talk more about that. But, but you know, I want to talk about that. And I want people to understand what the professor said. That in the textbooks, uh, textbook used at his college, they promote, uh, and this is Introduction to American Government, they promote the Black Lives Matter movement that we now know, you know, there's Black Lives Matter Global Action Network. It's an organization that admittedly is a Marxist organization, and they have now been caught in basically what is a financial grift. And because of that, they have lost over 80% of their donations. And uh, the data is now showing, uh, since they've been in existence, they really haven't taken uh, or I should say they really haven't done much for the African-American communities here in the United States, even though they've taken in millions and millions of dollars. And again, when you're teaching a class, uh, Introduction to American Government, um, I would suspect that you'd want to talk about Marxism as a bad thing. Am I right? Well, generally, I mean, that's, you know, Marxism is what led to the, the communist revolutions in multiple countries in the 20th century, and I think led to the deaths of somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 million people, uh, which is almost 20 times as many people as the Nazis killed uh, in the Jewish community. So yeah, Marxism is generally seen as, as, as pretty bad, uh, traditionally, uh, in American politics. Um, you know, and, and to kind of jump off your point real quick, in my book, I talk about Brianna Taylor's mom and how she mentions that she could show up to a Louisville Black Lives Matter meeting and no one would know who she was because they didn't do anything to help her. They raised money off her, her daughter's name, but did nothing to help her. Uh, and then the the, the um, little documentary that Candace Owens did, George Floyd's old roommates and family didn't get anything from him either. You know, and so it's definitely a grift. Uh, it's something that it's just shameful, but at least the truth is coming out now. Well, and you're absolutely right. So there you were uh, stuck having to talk about that. Uh, Fast forward to uh, last year, you were the guest of the National Police Association at CPAC Texas, um, where uh, you uh, talked to a lot of people. You had the book there. uh, And and I I sat next to you for quite a while Mm -hmm. and heard how you discuss these issues. And you do it um, with that sense of of academic facts um right i mean this go ahead sorry yeah well no but and that is the way that we need to discuss this isn't very factually um without emotion correct because you know emotion is something that uh doesn't do well in intellectual discussions you know and so that's one of the things i've always tried to do when talking about this subject i know it's very uh sensitive um especially for people who who might be affected uh by it. Uh, But the reality is that, you know, in the last 30 to 40 years, policing has dramatically changed in this country. Um, You know, speaking with uh, members of this book club at the St. Philip's College uh, last spring uh, that were talking about, oh, well, you know, back when my grandfather was in Alabama in the 1950s, he got beat by police. Well, yeah, and that that was an unfortunate time, to say the least, in American history, but policing has not been that way for a very, very long time in this country. And and the data is clear uh, among academics and among those who are willing to look. Um, But the the problem is that our media doesn't do that. Um, The the statistic that gets thrown around all the time as somehow proof of uh, of discrimination is that African-Americans make up 13% of the population, but 26% of police killings, uh, which is true, but it is lacking a lot of nuance. Um, it does not take into account um, the amount of police contact uh, with blacks versus other uh, particular um, races and the amount of crime that is committed by different you know, different races, which is, you know, this is documented not just from the FBI and the CDC, but even from the National Crime Victim Survey, which doesn't involve law enforcement. So it can't be tainted 
by any kind of bias. And, and what we know is that when you factor in that account, uh, you know, whites are actually slightly more likely to be killed by police and in the similar circumstances. But if you were to look at the media, it's almost like they think that they, they kind of portray this idea that only black people get killed and no one else. And that's obviously not true. Well, yeah. And just so folks know the statistics, we, we American law enforcement, we end up having to kill about a thousand people a year. Last year it was 1,147. And, uh, and, uh, of those statistics, um, we usually end up killing about 200 uh, African Americans. And mm -hmm. so this, but yet people know, and we've done polling on this, that, that um, people believe what they hear in the media and what they are told by activists, that there is somehow mm -hmm. this war on African American men by the American law enforcement officer. Additionally, uh, the killing of an unarmed African-American man by American law enforcement is a rarity. And when you look at mm -hmm. year to year, those statistics, um, what we would call and uh, what the FBI, for example, would call an unarmed person is uh, very often uh, someone with a car trying to kill a police officer, someone uh, who is trying to disarm or has disarmed that police mm -hmm. officer. And as you know, Will, every year there are, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten police officers killed each year um, by hands, fists and feet. So an unarmed person yes. can kill a law enforcement officer or an, you know, an innocent third person. So, again, one of the things that you talk about in the book, and I know one of the things you talk about in class is those nuances that it's not just this, uh, if, forgive me, black and white issue of, right. you know, here's who the police kill, who's who, or who they are. And and again, you were a police officer and, you know, not one morning did you or I, when I was a police officer, wake up and say, gosh, I hope I get to kill somebody today. That's not right. how we do things. And most of us never have to kill somebody in the line of duty. Most of us are never in that deadly force situation in our entire career. So in the career of a police officer, it's a real rarity, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, I, I did draw my weapon a few times, never had to fire. Um, it, you know, talking to the, the officers I worked with, I think maybe two or three out of the hundred or so officers that, you know, combined probably had over a thousand years or so of, of experience. I think only two or three ever actually had to fire their weapon. Um, because it is exceedingly rare to have to do that. Um, and when it does, it, it happens to somebody that um, was on a different shift than I was, but I knew it's very emotionally stressful and and, and can be very difficult to deal with. Um, a buddy of mine with San Antonio police had a justified shooting and the person died. And, and I remember he told me for almost a month, every time he closed his eyes, he could see it and he couldn't sleep. And, and that was you know, doing their job, but it, we're, we're human and we have feelings. And, and this is something the media, you know, treats us as we're like some kind of robot that, that we're, we're never supposed to make a mistake and never have to feel emotion. And, and, you know, that's just not the case at all. Absolutely. So uh, you've been getting some national attention here, not just because of the awesome book, um, but because you're spending a little more uh, time at home than, uh, than usual to <laughs> talk about that. Yeah. So uh, in addition to, you know, the the complaint that I had last year from an employee, um, there there was some rumblings at the college because uh, I put some pictures of you and me on Facebook uh, from CPAC and a picture of me with Steve Williford, um, the Sullivan Springs hero. And somebody at the college I worked with who I thought was a friend of mine, you know, started saying that, I was uh, associating with a, an anti-democratic group that was a threat to democracy, that was a racist organization, speaking of CPAC. Um, and, you know, I, over the course of, of this past year, um, I guess a, a, some sort of a target was, was on my back. And uh, back in February, a student uh, made some complaints about me um, that ultimately led to my dismissal from the college, uh, despite the fact that about half the rest of the class testified that what she was claiming was was false. 
but they didn't seem to, the truth didn't really seem to matter um, to the college, uh, presumably from everybody uh, that I've talked to. Uh, it was just an excuse to to get rid of me, you know, dating back because of my views, my time as a cop in this book. Uh, one of the complaints, um, a couple of complaints that the student made had nothing to do with policing. But one, uh, when we were talking about the Tyree Nichols case uh, and George Floyd as well, talking about, you know, how those types of incidences affect the legitimacy of state power, which is obviously something you talk about in a political science class. Um, she made the claim that I was advocating that we needed police brutality. Um, you know, and for those people that know me or have read my book, you know, that's like the last thing in the world I would ever make a claim for. Uh, and I have people of, you know, different races and, and political backgrounds that have testified um, or written an affidavit uh, that that was not true. But the college, I, I guess, presumably saw this as a, another excuse to get rid of uh, a conservative white male who was fighting back against the narrative uh, that they promoted that college um, through their anti-racism book club and their DI programs and, and the speakers that they get for convocation, um, which all, all promoted, um, you know, this worldview that America is a systemically racist country that picks on black people. And I just well, don't do buy you, into that. Do you think that this is uh, what's happening to you right now is part of this overall war on cops, this, this overall bad attitude, if you will, toward the American law enforcement officer. I do. I think, you know, the people that are on my hiring committee knew that I was a cop. It was there in my my uh, application. But I think the the book uh, and specifically what I teach being brought to the to the uh, attention of the, of the college, um, my participation in a few of the anti-racism book clubs, which was basically just an hour to bash police in America, um, and me speaking up in that book club, uh, trying to defend the police and, and show them what the real statistics are, at least, you know, like I said, in the last 40 years. I think, you know, it was just a, a situation where they were like, this is not somebody we want here, um, you know, and I think had this complaint been made in February and I had never written the book, I never attended CPAC, I probably would have not been let go or fired or however you want to want to phrase it. It was officially a non-renewal, uh, but, you know, my evaluations were all excellent, um, you know, and, and the allegations were false to begin with. I think, you know, I would still be employed there. Uh, but for, for me, I, I take it as a situation where they just look at it as this is just somebody who's going to be a fly in the ointment of, of the narrative we want to push. And so we're just going to get rid of him as soon as we can. Well, and you're not the first person this has happened to. You know, I interviewed uh, Liz Collin, uh, who a, was a CBS reporter in Minneapolis. She also wrote an excellent book. And, and her husband, Lieutenant Bob Kroll, was the head of the union for the Minneapolis Police Department. And she got basically sat down in an office, taken off her anchor job simply because she was married to a police officer mm -hmm. and, uh, and they got uh, doxxed and, uh, and he got uh, frankly abused at work simply because of his position and his politics. So this happens uh, mm -hmm. more often, I think, than, than people realize now, just so everybody knows, Dr. Moravitz has, uh, has an attorney and he is working through, our system, uh, you know, our justice system that that he and I both believe in, and uh, and uh, he will keep you updated. We'll give you his social media information. But you know, I want to talk about in these last couple of minutes about fighting that false narrative, this false narrative that you have now lost your job because of trying to fight it. That somehow the American law enforcement officer is the problem and and right now we we are in an atmosphere where we have uh 40 more police officers shot in this country than we did in 2020 uh you know we've had over 170 police officers shot already this year uh it's a very dangerous time for our profession will and part of that uh is because of this false narrative if people keep hearing that somehow we're the bad guys and we're the ones who are going to attack you, then I think there's an element of the population that feels like they have to attack us first. Talk about fighting the false narrative. Well, you're right. I mean, one of the things that was said in this book club 
was that you know a, a faculty member made the claim that they they would be nervous to call police for help because they'd be afraid that they would be the ones to get hurt and i'm just uh, just amazed and we have approximately 385 million police contacts between police and the public um, each year and we said about 1100 of them last year ended in in a fatality you do the math on that it's astronomically low that you would be hurt by a police officer especially if you are complying and you know not not causing you know an uh, escalation um but it, it it's you got to fight back on 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 the narrative with with data because it, you're not going to get that from the media and just a couple little ex excerpts uh you know, from the book, there was a study done by uh, the youngest ever tenured professor at Harvard University, a black man named Roland Fryer, uh, looking at Houston, Texas, right? The data shows that black people are actually 23.8% less likely to be shot at by police than were white people, right? And that's that's just in, in Houston, Texas. Well, where can people find the book? And then where can they find you if they want to hear more? Uh, the easiest place is uh, going to Amazon. Uh, of course, this is what the book looks like. It's uh, Blue Divide, Policing and Race in America. Um, you can find me on Twitter at WMoravitz23. Uh, that's W, M as in Mary, O-R-A, B as in Victor, I-T-S, 23. Or you can go to willmoravitz.com. You can uh, find my book there. And you can also uh, request me to speak or read my Substack um, articles. And that's the easiest way to reach out to me. I tell you, I, uh, I can't wait to hear how this story ends. I know you're going to keep us posted on Twitter. And uh, thanks again for being with us uh, for the second time. And if you would like more information about the National Police Association, visit us at nationalpolice.org. Last year, law enforcement officers were involved in hundreds of thousands of use of force incidents. A use of force incident is when an officer must use nonverbal tactics to gain control of a dangerous situation. Put the knife on the ground. In many cases, officers have no choice but to use force when a suspect doesn't comply with a lawful order. Use of force is always ugly. No one likes it, especially police officers. Together, we can help de-escalate these dangerous encounters. Help police officers by complying with their lawful orders. Don't attack, attempt to disarm, or flee from an officer. Use of force is an officer's last option. Most incidents can be avoided by not resisting arrest. If you feel you've been wrongfully detained by a police officer, then seek a legal solution after the encounter has been resolved. Let's keep everyone safe. Comply now and complain later.